Praise God. Ready for the word of God this morning. Exodus 32. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go, get thee down for your people, which you brought out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way, which I commanded them. They have made them a molten calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed thereunto and said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought you up out of the land of Egypt. What a horrendous thing to do. And the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore let me alone that my wrath may wax hot against them, and that I may consume them, and I will make of you a great nation. And Moses besought the Lord his God, and said, Lord, why doth your wrath wax hot against your people, which you brought forth out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say for mischief, did their God bring them out to slay them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from thy fierce wrath and repent of this evil against your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swear by your own self, and said unto them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of the heaven, and all this land that I have spoken of will I give unto your seed, and they shall inherit it forever. It's an incredible, incredible prayer, a great prayer of intercession that Moses brings before Almighty God. And as Moses stands in the gap between God and his wrath and the people of God who are going to receive that wrath, it's good to see how Moses prays. First of all, he says, God, they are your people. You brought them out. There's great significance to that. They are the people of God. Secondly, he goes on to say, what would the Egyptians say? You brought them out to do them harm. What is Moses concerned about here? He's actually concerned about the reputation of God. He's concerned about the glory of God. And then he goes on to say, remember your promises. In other words, he reminded God of his own word. Remember your word, Lord. Here are your promises. Right there, there's three powerful, powerful truths for true prayer and true intercession. Number one. When we pray about the church and we pray about God's people, we recognize and acknowledge they belong to him. Number two, we recognize as we pray, this is about God's glory and his reputation. And the third one is that we always remind God of his word and his promises. Did you know God likes to be reminded of his word? You may have given a word to somebody once and then wish you'd never done it and get really annoyed when you're reminded that you gave your word. But it's the opposite with God. He loves it when we bring his word to him and say, Lord, this is what you promised. Now fulfill your promise. We must remind ourselves that the church belongs to God. She is his new creation. Through the shed blood of Jesus, through the water and the word, through the spirit, we are his peculiar possession and he has called us out, saints, He's called us out to show forth his praises. We exist to praise him and to bring him honor and glory. Can you say amen to that? We exist to praise him. He called us out that we will praise him. And we should be concerned about his name and his reputation and his glory. How many of you here today are concerned about the name and the reputation of Almighty God, the name of Jesus? I found it quite amazing. I didn't see it, I didn't hear it, and I don't want to hear it. But apparently there were some blasphemous comments made on, is it the project? And I heard that there was more Muslims protesting against the blasphemous nature of what they said against Jesus than there were Christians. And I thought, wow, isn't that interesting? It's amazing how as Christians we can be so, uh, show such, such a lack of concern of his name and his reputation and his glory. The world often judges God by his church. And you see different people in church life who are willing to go out publicly 
to defend themselves and in doing so bring shame upon the church and the name of the Lord. If we're God's people, we should be concerned about his glory. Can you say amen to that? We should be concerned about his name and his reputation. And so this morning I want to ask that question, are we concerned about the church? That's a question you can answer this morning. Are you concerned about the church? And what is your concern? Are you, is your concern that people are suffering, that churches are losing members, that there's compromise in the church? Or are we concerned about the fact that when the church is portrayed in a negative light, when the church is weak, when the church compromises, it's a negative and bad reflection on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We often don't think about that. We forget about it because we constantly think about ourselves. Are we aware that Jesus bled and died to bring the church into existence? This is something that I like to share every time I'm asked to speak at an AGM and there's voting going on. I stand up and I say, we're not here to get our man in. We're here to get God's person in. We're here to find out what God wants to do. We belong to him. The church was purchased with his blood. He suffered to bring us into existence. And we have to have an awareness that the church exists to bring glory unto him. It's amazing when Jesus prayed in John 17, just before he's going to go to the cross. And one of the things he praises is not, Lord, I've done all of the miracles. I've done this, that, and the other. He says, Lord, Father, I have glorified you. I have glorified you. Do you know, if we get that into our hearts and into our spirits, it will revolutionize our lives and revolutionize the church. So often the church is doing things for the wrong motives. And the bottom line is we should be like our Lord and Savior and say, Lord, we are here to glorify you. Can you say amen to that? When you look at Jesus in the temple, and if you remember what Jesus did in the temple, what did Jesus do in the temple? He got quite passionate, didn't he? And he drove out the money changers, and he overturned the tables, and he got the whip out. Why did he do that? He did it because it was his father's house. I remember one time at Bible college, we were talking about anger, and what is the difference between anger, which is not righteous, and anger that is righteous. You'll see that every time that Jesus got angry, it was something to do with his father's house, his father's name, or that his father's people were being ill-treated being led astray. That's righteous anger. I believe we need that back in the church today. There should be a protection in us for the glory of God and wanting to see him glorified. That passion came out in such an extent that he got violent with those people and drove them out with a whip. And I think that's a beautiful thing. He looked at his father's house and his father's name and his father's holiness and glory and he saw that it was being despised and exploited. And that's when that righteous anger rose up in him. How many of you here today have a righteous anger in you when you see things like that happening? And we need to have it if we are to pray effectively. If we're to intercede effectively, the motivation needs to start in this place. Everybody here loves their own reputation, don't they? If someone starts to defame you, if someone starts to criticize you, or somebody you love, there's a response. True? There's quite a strong response. How many of you here got somebody in your life that you love? If someone starts to attack them and criticize them, what happens inside of you? Someone starts to attack your wife or your children. There's a righteous anger that comes up. I want to tell you, we should have that in our lives for the name of Jesus and for the glory of Jesus. There's times when I see things on the media with other churches and church leaders and my first response is, how could you do this and bring the Lord's name into disrepute? Wouldn't you rather just go suffer silently and protect the name of the Lord? We have a responsibility and an understanding to realize that in our lives. Hallelujah. How much do we truly care about the church in relation to the fact it's a reflection of God? And when people look at the church... They can see things where they end up criticizing God because of our behavior. What about our behavior in church? We heard an incredible, powerful truth in communion last Sunday. 
realizing, discerning that we are a part of his body, his body that he bled for, that he died for. And every single time I'm dealing with a child of God, that's what I need to remember. This is God's child. Jesus died for this person. What am I doing to keep the unity of the Spirit in relation to this person? Do you know, we can be challenged to treat people nicely, but until we get this conviction deep down inside, Jesus bled for his church. This is his church. I must do everything within myself to keep the unity of the Spirit. And that often means suffering, doesn't it? Are you willing to suffer to protect the unity of the Holy Spirit? We can all be so sensitive and all be uh, so easily take offense with people around us. And we've got to start learning, lay that down. This is his church. The way I respond to my brother or my sister is a reflection on the name of the Lord. Amen? What will our response to these things be? We will endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit. In Acts chapter 4, verse 25 to 31, we read, Who by the mouth of his servant David said, Why does the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For of a truth against your holy child Jesus, whom you have anointed, both Herod, Pontius Pilate and the Gentiles and the people of Israel have gathered against to do whatsoever your hand and your counsel determine before to be done. This is them praying in the book of Acts in the midst of persecution. And they say, And now, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto your servant that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching forth your hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of your holy child Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place which they were in was shaken. Praise God. Who wants to see this place shaking? And they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. If you look at this situation, Peter and John had been arrested. And when you get arrested, it's not a nice thing, is it, to be thrown into prison, to be accused, etc. And so often when we're praying, we pray as if it's all about us and what we are going through, what I'm suffering. A lot of people are even in that position when nothing has actually come against them and it's just fear of what is coming. We're constantly consumed with ourselves, our comfort, our own fears. But as these men prayed, there was an insight that this persecution against them personally wasn't actually against them, but it was against the Lord and against his Christ and against, as they say it, thy holy child Jesus. We need to understand that what we face in life, when persecution comes against us, there's a spirit behind it. And that spirit is coming against God and coming against his name. And we are ambassadors of Jesus Christ. And we've got to have a consciousness of this that will enable us to stand up and make sure that our actions and reactions will be such that we give glory to his name. If you were not a Christian, the things that you're suffering in the way of persecution wouldn't happen. But because you belong to him, these things will come against you. Let me say it again. We need to be concerned about God and his glory. You notice that as Moses was praying, he's saying, what will the heathen say? We need a passion for God. In Psalm 68, verse 1, I love this verse. It says, let God arise and his enemies be scattered. Who likes that verse? Let them that hate him flee before him. Do you know a lot of times when we are thinking on this verse, it's quite easy to think like this. Let God arise and let my enemies be scattered. And you hear when people are praying and that's really what's on their heart and their mind. It's not our enemies. It's God's enemies that we're dealing with here because we belong to him. And the moment we belong to him, we're birthed into a warfare and those enemies ultimately are coming against God. Amen? Hallelujah. So going back to Moses, Exodus 32, verse 31, uh, chapter 32, verse 31. And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, O this people have sinned a great sin and made them gods of gold. Yet now, if you will forgive their sin 
And if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book, which thou hast written. Do you know, whenever I read those words, I think, Moses, what were you saying? Can you imagine saying to God, yes, they've sinned, and it's a horrible sin. It's a sin of idolatry, sin of rebellion. He says they've sinned, but God, please forgive them. And if you don't blot my name out of your book, that's an incredible thing. Do you know, saints, if we want to pray in an effective way for revival and for the state and the condition of the church, these truths that I'm speaking about this morning, we've got to have them as a conviction in our hearts and our minds. These are the type of prayers that God listens to. When we come to God and we pray for His church, not because we want to see certain things or because we're upset with what we think is right and wrong, but we come and with a heart that comes before God and says, God, for your glory, for the sake of the suffering of Jesus, Lord, move in your church, that men and women and the heathens would see your glory and your name will be praised. I want to tell you that's the type of powerful praying that this nation needs to see, to see revival. I've said it so many times, it's not good enough just to say, this is the great south land of the Holy Spirit. Anyone can say that. What is needed is men and women of God who know how to pray, and they pray from that place of number one, God, this is about you. This is about your glory. This is about the suffering of Jesus on the cross. Lord, move in the church of this nation that your name, we heard it in worship this morning, that we would exalt his name, that we would lift his name on high. Hallelujah. There's so much that happens in the church that does the opposite. And I tell you, I want to be in a church and a part of the church that brings glory to his name. Hallelujah. What a sublime prayer that was for Moses. Blot me out of your book. It sounds a bit like our Savior, doesn't it? Who was willing to say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. I lay my life down in sacrifice. How many people in the church today are willing to do that in prayer to say, God, it's all about you. Come and move for your glory. Hallelujah. That's the heart of an effective intercessor. It's not the heart of someone that criticizes and turns against the people that they're praying for, but it's the heart of a man or a woman who's willing to sacrifice themselves for those that they pray for. That's such a powerful thing. I've heard people pray for others so powerfully, and then later on you hear the way they talk about them, and I just think to myself, you have cancelled every one of your prayers. You've cancelled every single one of them. We can't pray to God to move sovereignly, to pour out his spirit and then turn around and just start criticizing his church. We've got to get rid of that spirit out of ourselves. The flesh is enticed to do that. We're enticed to criticize and the devil comes in and he begins to move through that. We've got to be men and women like Moses. And I tell you, you need the grace of God. Many, many times I've been challenged in this area. We need the grace of God to lay it down and say, no, Lord, this is your church. These are your people. Even if they're sinning, Lord, forgive them and come and raise up a glorious church that your name might be glorified. Hallelujah. Could you imagine a church where we always spoke life about each and every one? Wouldn't that be powerful? We don't want to give the, word, the devil words to get hold of as we criticize and put people down. We want to lift up. We want to encourage. Hallelujah. God said to Moses, I'll make you a great nation. Wow. This is not someone promising to give you a position, to give you some money. This is the creator of heaven and earth who spoke the world into being, saying, I'm going to make you a great nation. When God says that, you've got omnipotence behind it. It's going to happen. He could have made of Moses a great nation, but instead of that, Moses, his heart again is, no, it's not about me. It's not about me, Lord. You promise to your people, this is your reputation that's on the line. This is about you and your glory. Isn't that wonderful? If you want to pray for something in the church, pray that we would have leaders like this who don't want to be promoted, who don't want titles and positions, but leaders who say, Lord, for your glory, raise up your church in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. 
Do you know one of the hardest things to get people to pray for is the church? It's one of the hardest things. I sat down with a group of pastors once and we were discussing like some intercession issues and I began to say how we need to pray for the church and everyone's like, yes, yes, yes. And then within less than a minute, everybody else was talking about anything and everything but the church. It's amazing how hard it is to get to people to pray for the church. We want to talk about the government. Those who like YouTubes want to talk about the Illuminati and the conspiracy theories, the perverts and the regressives, as I call them, our problems, our freedoms. And there's a place for the things that we face in life, church. There's a place where we need to pray for certain things, but these things are passing away. And we need to get a heart for the church of Jesus Christ. And I want to tell you something. When the church of Jesus Christ becomes all that she's supposed to be, these other issues will start to reduce and reduce as the light of the church gets stronger and stronger. It doesn't work the other way around. You could get the best government in the world in this nation of Australia. And if the church is not where she should be, we will still reap corruption and destruction the answer is God and his church amen Isaiah 62 verses 1 to 3 I love these scriptures and when you hear the word Zion in Israel just put the word the church in for the New Testament for Zion's sake will I not hold my peace and for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest until the righteousness thereof goes forth as brightness and the salvation thereof as a lamp that burns and the gentiles the unbelievers shall see your righteousness and all the kings your glory and you shall be called by a new name which the mouth of the lord shall name thou shalt also be a crown of glory in the hand of the lord and a royal diadem in the hand of thy god what a glorious prayer that is who, who here wants to pray for the church I will not keep silent until the church starts to shine. I will not keep silent until the church becomes what Jesus has called the church to be. Hallelujah. When revival hits, what does it do? It revives. That means that which is languishing is revived. In other words, revival is for the church. Awakening is for the, the lost. Revival is for the church. And when true revival hits... And I'm talking about true revival. The light becomes so bright that the world starts coming in to see what's going on. And that's what we need to see in this nation. The church bears his name. We were brought into being by God. It is not an institution or an organization. It is his body. Hallelujah. A crown of glory in the hand of the Lord. A royal diadem in the hand of our God righteousness shining bright, salvation a lamp burning, and a witness to the lost. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 to 3, it speaks about praying for all of those that are in authority. And it says, for kings and for all those in authority, that we, the church, may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. And then it goes on to speak about people being saved. So even when the church is called to pray for the government, it's not called to pray for the government to be saved. It's called to pray for the government so that the church can have peace to live the life that God's called them to live. So what is the focus there? It's actually not the government. The focus is still his church. And we've got to understand this because we keep focusing on the wrong thing. And I want to tell you, no government will bring revival. It's not going to happen. Some people believe it would, but it won't. It is the church of Jesus Christ when the Spirit of God begins to move in our midst. So should we pray for government? Yes, the Bible tells us to. Why? So that the church can arise and be effective and reach the lost. Can you say amen to that? Hallelujah. I am convinced that the greatest need facing us today is not the government, it's not false religions, it's not the elites that want to control the world. It's not the regressives. I believe the greatest need is the state and the condition of the church. That's the bottom line. God's church, God's name in his glory is what you and I should be concerned about. 
And we need to pray until her righteousness goes forth as brightness and salvation as a lamp that burns. We need to lay down, church, our own agendas, our own hurts, our own frustrations, our own criticisms, and we need to pray for the church. And I mean truly pray for her. Not soulish, fleshly prayers where I'm praying my will be done and Lord, these people should be doing this and they shouldn't be doing that. We've got to get out of the flesh and we've got to move in the spirit and start praying the way that God wants us to pray. And those scriptures in Exodus are a good place to start. Meditate upon them. Prayers that touch the heart of God, that flow forth from faith. Hallelujah. We need to pray for the outpouring of His Holy Spirit. That's the ultimate thing, I believe, that we as a church will come to a place where we say this one thing, God have mercy upon us and pour out Your Spirit upon us that we will be revived. Hallelujah. Hallelujah and that your church will bring glory to your name. How awesome is that? That's what we need to be, church. Let's stand this morning.